Well, good evening and welcome everybody uh, to this WALPA Wellbeing Forum on Living Well with Back Pain, Learning About Your Back Pain and the Best Way to Manage It. And a very special welcome if this is your first time being with us this evening. My name's Julie McCrossan. It's my pleasure to be your host this evening. And this webinar is also being community hosted by WALPA Jewish Hospital, Friends of WALPA, and our partner tonight is Musculoskeletal Australia. Now, Walpa Jewish Hospital, if you're new to us, is a leading private hospital in Wallara in eastern Sydney. It provides rehabilitation, medical and palliative care to everyone in the community within a framework of Jewish culture and religious and dietary requirements. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that we're all uh, on Aboriginal land and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We're actually on a number of Aboriginal lands, so uh, I, I won't name any individual group. Just while a few more people are, are joining us tonight, uh, some quick housekeeping. Your questions are welcome. We've received quite a lot in advance and you can put more tonight, starting right now, in the Q&A. Remember, we can't see or hear you at home, so your way to communicate with us is through the Q&A. And we have a question moderator, Dr. Lena Safro, a, a, an experienced general practitioner. She's monitoring your questions, and I will come, her, come to her regularly during the evening's discussions uh, to put your questions to the panel. I, I do need to tell you that we will put all the questions anonymously, and we'll try to answer as many as we can, but we're unable to give individual medical advice. Obviously, that's between uh, you and your general practitioner and any specialist that you're seeing. And a reminder that this webinar is being filmed and will be available on the WALPA website uh, uh, very shortly and can be viewed uh, over coming months and even years as a, a full selection there. Well, let's begin. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome our partner this evening to introduce the topic. Welcome to Ornella Clavisi, General Manager, Consumer Services with Musculoskeletal Australia. Welcome to you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so just, uh, I guess, to start off with, for those that are, you know, unfamiliar with Musculoskeletal Australia, we are a consumer organisation supporting people with musculoskeletal conditions. And when we talk about musculoskeletal conditions, we talk about those conditions which affect the muscles, bones and joints. Uh, we uh, Conditions such as back pain, arthritis, osteoporosis, uh, gout, lupus, there are 150 plus conditions which fall under that musculoskeletal banner. Uh, and we work as an organisation to empower people to live well and to manage their condition, to understand how to manage and live well in terms of uh, getting information about their condition, having an understanding of medications and other non-medical treatments. We have a number of resources for people to be able to access uh, through information resources and webinars. We have a national helpline which supports uh, people through our nurses. We uh, provide advocacy and we support research. In fact, many of the panels, in fact, I think all of the panelists here we've worked with as an organisation in supporting research and really involving consumers in research. I think when we think about musculoskeletal conditions, we think about it in terms of, uh, you know, pain and mobility issues. But it goes even beyond that. And we've found um, doing a needs analysis and national surveys, we've found that the pain is an issue and it impacts people's lives quite vastly in terms of their ability to work, their ability to um, socialise, to sleep, and all of those things have an impact on their lives. It affects their mental health and their ability to function every day uh, and just do everyday things like putting out the washing, going to the shops, doing up your bra, all of those things can impact uh, your ability to live fully. And as an organisation, we understand that and we support people uh, in any way we can. Uh, and uh, we, we pride ourselves in being consumer focused and we have a consumer advisory committee which help us in all of the decisions that we make in our programs and, um, and how we go forward. And I guess that 
is an introduction into uh, our organisation and what we do. Uh, and I guess that that will be interesting in terms of being here and being part of the panel to discuss uh, back pain and managing musculoskeletal conditions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ornella Clavisi uh, from Musculoskeletal Australia. And uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, welcome if you've just joined us. Uh, at the very end of tonight, you will be sent an email uh, with a, a, an opportunity to give us feedback, which we take very seriously, and also links to good evidence-based resources, including uh, the website of Musculoskeletal Australia. Just before I introduce our panel, we like to get uh, to know a little bit about our audience and that informs the panel discussions. And so we have now a live poll for you. Essentially, we're going to put up a question. I'll read it for you. You answer it. We get the answer in real time. Uh, so we'll go through this poll, learn a little bit about you, and then I'll uh, welcome our panel to begin our discussions. So uh, if I could ask Nat, our mysterious technical host, could you put up the first question? Your age, please make a single choice. 29 years or under, 30 to 49 years, 50 to 79, 80 years or over. Please answer. And we've got the uh, answers coming up. Uh, no one under 20, 29 or under, 4%. 30 to 49, 73%, 50 to 79, and 23%, 80 and over. Thank you so much. Our next question, please. Gender, your gender, female, male, other, prefer not to say. Please answer. That pops up the answer. Thank you. 75% female, 25% male, and no other answers. Thank you so much. Our next question, please. Do you have or have you ever had pain or an ache in your back? Yes or no? Ninety-five percent yes, five percent no. Thank you. Next question, please. How long did the pain or ache last? Less than three months, three to twelve months, over twelve months. Thanks, Nat. You're doing a great job of whacking up the answers when you see fit. Less than three months, 30%, three to 12, 13%, and over 12 months, 57%. Thank you. Our next question. When your back pain or ache was at its worst, did you have difficulty carrying out any of the following activities? And you can click as many as are relevant. Walking, sitting, standing, lying, dressing yourself, climbing stairs, getting out of a chair. You see some answers, Nat, do you think? 77% walking, 54% sitting, 60% standing, 32% lying, 28% dressing yourself, 45% climbing stairs, 42% getting out of a chair. Thank you. We have three more questions for you. Does back pain or ache ever keep you from sleeping at night? Yes, frequently. Yes, sometimes. No. Yes, frequently 13%. Yes, sometimes 43%. No, 43%. Thank you. Uh, next, we have just two more to go. 
what do you think caused your back pain? And if you could just give one choice here, please. A slip disc, a fall, aging, arthritis, other. Thank you. 15% a slip disc, 6% a fall, 17% aging, 34% arthritis, 29% other. Thank you. And our final question. How do you think your low back pain should be treated? Multiple choice. So you can put more than one thing. Surgery, exercise, lifestyle changes, medication, other. Thanks, sir. 19% have said surgery, 87% exercise, 51% lifestyle changes, 52% medication, and 16% other. Look, thank you so much. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce and welcome our panel, and I'll give a detailed introduction when I go to each person with questions. But joining us is Cody Kane, uh, who is um, in charge of physiotherapy and day services, the manager of these services at Walper Jewish Hospital, and Cody is a physiotherapist himself. Uh, Professor James McCauley, a psychologist, a researcher, and I'll give you a great expert on pain and pain management. I'll tell you more when I introduce him. Professor Paulo Ferreira, a physiotherapist, and again, another expert on musculoskeletal health uh, and a, a director of, of a... Uh, research Centre at the University of Sydney. And let me introduce in full our first speaker this evening, Professor Rochelle Bookbinder AO, rheumatologist by training, a medical doctor, and head of musculoskeletal health and wiser healthcare units in the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at Monash University. Welcome. This is deaf sign clapping, so it's my way of welcoming you and clapping. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Always. Thanks, uh, Julie. And Rochelle, thank you for joining us because I know you're back from an international conference and haven't been back too long. Now, you're a great believer that there are myths that need to be busted. So let's just get a few facts on the table uh, as a, a person dealing uh, with people dealing with back issues all the time. That back pain affects 90% of people, often recurrent, but it usually goes quickly. Can you just speak to that, please? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me as well. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so the, the the poll was interesting in that 95% of people had had or have back pain at any one point in time. And that's usually what we see in surveys uh, with about 25% of people having pain currently. So probably one in four people on this meeting will have current back pain. Uh, what we know about back pain is that often... It, it often comes acutely and often it goes away quickly within days or weeks. Uh, but in a small proportion of people, um, the pain can persist. Um, and in people in whom the pain goes away, it often recurs. So I guess what we might be having also on this panel, because a lot of people said they had chronic pain, uh, people with a special interest in back pain are, are tuning in. So I think we might have a bit of a skewed audience. Um, and so what is I think the key message about the causes of back pain? Yeah. So in so there are only very few specific causes of back pain, serious causes that we really want to identify early. And they include include things like cancer, so a metastasis or primary cancer in the back, um, infection, um, a fracture, vertebral fracture, uh and then the inflammatory arthritis, such as spondyloarthritis that rheumatologists see. Um, and then there is a subgroup. And so they're the, they're the really serious causes that we want to identify early and they have specific management. And then the vast majority of the remainder are what we call non-specific back pain. And that means that we can't 
usually I identify a specific cause uh, and imaging in those patients won't help us to identify a cause uh, and then they're really managed very similarly. And then there is a little other subgroup where people have back pain with or without pain radiating down their legs. Usually that's due to um, um, a pressure on a nerve and we call that in lay terms sciatica. Uh, or in medical terms, a radicular a radiculopathy. Uh, and then I guess for this audience who are older, um, the serious causes, are, there's a higher risk of the serious causes in older patients. Uh, and there's a thing called lumbar canal stenosis where there's narrowing of the central canal that, that may also lead to back pain, but more particularly uh, pain down the legs, limiting people's ability to walk very far. So, so they're we sp the, the causes. That's how we split them. We spoke uh, earlier today and you said that in the vast majority of cases in primary care, so with your general practitioner, there is no need for investigations in the form of scans, that what is usually absolutely sufficient is a very good history and that the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, which is a federal body that seeks to uh, put out advisories to both patients and uh, the professions, uh, that, that guidelines, again, are warning against over-investigations. Could you explain the thinking there, please? Yeah. So we know that as you get older, uh, there are changes that we see on plain X-rays, CT scans and MRIs, that occur in asymptomatic people. And one of the problems with imaging and this misconception that you need an image to find the cause and the cause, and therefore you can get the appropriate treatment, is that these abnormalities that we see increase with age and are almost just as common in people without symptoms compared to people with symptoms. So when in an individual patient where we see these changes, there's no way of knowing where they're just related to being normal for age and not being at all related to their pain or whether they have some connection to the pain, but we can't currently tell that. And, and the problem is that often people get imaging, um, they get a very complicated report that causes anxiety, both by the patient and also their doctor. And that might lead to more harm than good by you know, referrals to surgeons, more tests, uh, invasive treatments that, that won't help. Uh, so, so that's why we think in most cases, unless there's suspicion of a serious cause, that imaging is, is not really helpful. It doesn't help us identify the cause and it doesn't help us to determine the best treatment. We have other experts we're about to bring on in this panel and the, the focus seems to be on, on a, what's called a psychosocial approach and we'll hear more about that in a minute but I just want to get some initial thoughts from you on the role of medication because I noted in our survey that quite a proportion of the people watching tonight are on medication so what are some of the key issues there? So the guidelines and the evidence has really changed over time. And we now know that most medications uh, provide no benefit or very small benefit, and but have significant risk of harms. So in the, in the old instance, we usually wanted to treat people with pain medications to get their pain under control and then think about other things after that. But these days, the first line treatment should be non-pharmacologic. Uh, and that's because things like um, paracetamol or Panadol uh, have been shown in, in high quality trials not to provide benefit. And then more, more um, stronger medications like opioids have also been shown to provide no benefit for people with acute pain. And they can actually prolong the disability in people with chronic pain. Just about the only thing for which there is benefit is anti-inflammatories, but that, that only provides a small benefit. And 
anti-inflammatories are often contraindicated as you get older because people often have have other medical problems that mean that they shouldn't take anti-inflammatories. And then there are a whole range of other medications of people that that have investigated like nerve-related pain medications, uh, antidepressant medications, muscle relaxants and all of these things have also been proven to um, be of no benefit and also increasingly potential for harm again particularly in older people so we we want now to really try and avoid medications if we can because they don't help all that much and they have significant risk of harm is that a hard message to give to people particularly if they've been prescribed in the past, which presumably quite a few people listening tonight have. So how do you manage that in clinical practice? So I I guess I'm in secondary care. So patients have usually been referred um, by their GP or or another specialist, uh, and they're often on medications. Uh, And so I just go through, like I'm trying to do now, explaining what the evidence is pro and against. Uh, And I'm not opposed to things like paracetamol, if they feel that does provide them benefit, then I don't see any problem with them continuing it, except that I explain to them what the evidence is, that that the trial suggests that the benefit isn't any greater than placebo. Um, For people who are already taking opioid medications, uh, I then really try hard to explain why it might be best to come off them, again, because they don't provide benefit. Um, but the longer you're on them, the more risks there are, such as becoming dependent on them and, and dose escalation and, and risks uh, when they're taken in combination with other drugs. Just before I, I, I go to another panel member to get a sense of what this psychosocial approach might mean, you do hear about people getting injections in their spine. Can you explain what that's about and, and your thinking there? Yes, so there are a number of different types of injections that that have been used or promoted. Uh, so you can get a, a steroid injection into your facet joints, uh, into your epidural space. Um, you can get other types of injections to numb the nerves. Uh, and you can even get uh, insertion of stimulators to try and suppress the pain signals to the brain what we know for people with back pain is that none of these things have been proven have been all of these things have been proven not to work so there's evidence of lack of benefit um, but significant in some instances significant risks of harm the about just about the only indication for an injection might be someone with acute sciatica, so pain going down the leg, where there has been demonstrated to be just a very short term relief of pain for those patients. Um, but like people with back pain, people with sciatic symptoms, they can also get better without treatment quite quickly in most cases. Just uh, tell us, you're a rheumatologist. What does that mean? What is a rheumatologist? Uh, I want to say that I spread rumours, but that's not right. Uh, A rheumatologist is really a physician, a medical specialist who specialises in arthritis and, you know, joints and bones. So think of us like a cardiologist is to a cardiothoracic surgeon. A rheumatologist is the medical equivalent of an orthopaedic surgeon. Okay, look, thank you so much and uh, welcome if you've just joined us. And what I'd like to do now is to speak to one more member of our panel and then we'll take some questions and we'll meet the rest of our panel. I'd like to welcome now the physiotherapist or one of the physiotherapists on our panel, uh, Professor Paulo Ferreira, uh, and he's Professor of Musculoskeletal Health and uh, a, a personal Uh, uh, sorry, a research academic director in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney and director of the Musculoskeletal Research Hub at the Charles Perkins Centre, which is also at the University of Sydney. So uh, welcome to you, sir, uh, to our discussion tonight. We've heard a sort of critique of some of them, you know, I guess of, uh, what would you say, uh, surgical and uh, pharmaceutical 
interventions. So can you tell us what this alternative, this psychosocial approach actually means and involves? Can you help us there? Sure. Thanks, Julian. It's a, yeah. um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And just a point of disclosure here, I'm just um, in the middle of an acute episode of back pain myself. So I'll be able to serve as a very interesting case for you. Um, we managed to adopt a couple of new dogs and they only happen to be sleeping in our bed and that makes you sleep in awkward positions, which is a trigger for back pain. So, um, yeah, look, Julie, I guess uh, when it comes to the, I mean, the psychological aspects of things, we, we've got James here that will be able to enlighten us with, with fantastic knowledge on the field. Um, I guess we... When it comes to back pain, you know, we've got these extremes of measures, you know, where you have in one side of the spectrum invasive procedures such as um, um, surgeries for complex case of back pain. And then you've got in the other um, side of the spectrum, you've got simple measures such as medication and so on. And I guess in the middle, you've got an array of options that, you know, people can can consider and some of them can be helpful and some um, not very helpful. Um, and uh, we, we do know that um, in the course of low back pain, and we've done quite a lot of research um, following people over time, what people do in terms of their lifestyle, what people do in terms of their well-being, it can be very impactful in back pain, either to prevent it or to actually uh, cause it. Um, and so the the whole psycho social approach to to back pain is what we we still believe. Um, we haven't done a lot on the social aspect of you know the the um, the full program. Um, I mean, but we do what know is the that. Social you mean contact with friends and family? Is that what you well, mean? Well, that's one aspect of that. Uh, we know that, for example, social isolation is a risk factor for back pain. So people who are more socially isolated, uh, they are uh, at greater odds of developing back pain and their uh, prognosis of back pain is actually worse. But uh, we haven't managed to do much in, in, in that aspect. Uh, but I guess there are, pro you know, there is quite a lot of um, progress in, in other um, fields as well and other aspects of, of the spectrum. When I spoke to you uh, in preparation for this evening, you said having back pain does not necessarily mean limiting your activity. Uh, on the contrary, that movement, uh, it, it can be an important thing. Can you ex just speak to that? Yeah, so, I mean, there is historical research um, in back pain since the 90s uh, showing that if you've got an acute episode of back pain or even if you have chronic back pain you are probably better off trying to uh, mobilize yourself trying to um, be as active as you can now of course trying to convince patients when they are under an acute episode of back pain like myself today it's not an easy task because there is a tendency for people to lie down and try to rest. It's really difficult for people in, in acute low back pain to get up and move around. I was having trouble this morning putting my shoes on, um, and, and that's quite distressful. Um, but as much as we, we can, uh, we do advise people to try to, um, to move as much as, as they can and um, consider that perhaps uh, they shouldn't be guided by only uh, how painful it is, but if they can do something, that little something that they can do is probably better than uh, just lying down um, in, in bed. And the eating and sleeping play a role. Can you explain eating? Is it more than simply uh, eating healthily so you're not overweight? Is, is overweight a problem if you're experiencing this pain? What, what is the message around eating and about sleeping other than have very small dogs? Uh, look, uh, looks like there is a, a little bit more evidence on the relationship between sleep and back pain than diet and back pain. Um, now, 
we do know that um, depending on what kind of diet you are on, you tend to increase over time chronic inflammatory markers. Um, and some people develop the kind of chronic, non-specific, whole body inflammation. And that appears to be a, an important aspect of, of chronic back pain. There are some small studies showing that uh, some diet interventions can be helpful in chronic back pain. Um, diets that um, uh, are usually associated with a lower intake of uh, carbohydrates and uh, an increase in protein intake. But these studies are still um, small and, and so they are probably preliminary um, in nature. Uh, but there seems to be some some um, is, um, preliminary evidence that in the future we might be seeing some types of diet interventions helping people with back pain. Now, being overweight and obesity, it's not necessarily a cause for back pain, but we know that people who are overweight and obese, their prognosis is a little bit worse. So there is there is something to to be considered there as well. And you're currently doing some research on what type of exercise, different types of exercise and what may or may not be more beneficial. Is that correct? Lots of people are, are doing that, truly, um, including people like, um, um, you know, James, myself, uh, Rochelle, uh, quite a, um, a good collection of researchers everywhere in Canada trying to pull the evidence on what type of exercise is better. Um, I would probably say that up until a couple of years ago, we would we would say that any kind of exercise is probably um, effective and positive in back pain, and that's probably true. There is some recent evidence that in the short term, maybe some types of exercise are slightly superior than others, um, especially exercise that are a little bit more specific, exercise that um, have the close attention and monitoring of healthcare practitioners. Uh, I can see that we've got Cody here and he probably will be able to share his experience with us as well. So it looks like in the short term, there are some types of exercise, uh, depending on the clinical outcome, that will be slightly superior than others. Um, but the good news is that in the long term, um, most types of exercise and leisure physical activities are beneficial for back pain. And, and, um, and so the advice that we usually give to people is try to find what's important for you, try to find what you like, and try to stick with that. Because let's face it, it's not really easy to adhere to um, exercise programs in the long term. Look, thank you so much. And if you've just joined us, we're obviously talking about uh, living well with back pain, managing back pain. And uh, uh, shortly, I will come to Professor James McCauley uh, with some interesting research uh, about uh, uh, perhaps some fresh approaches in terms of retraining the brain or changing neural pathways in relation to pain. But just before we come to that, uh, I'd like to invite our question moderator, our, our general practitioner, Dr. Lena who is monitoring uh, the questions coming in. Welcome to you, Dr. Safra. What, what are some of the questions? If you could kick one off, please. You need to turn on your uh, uh, microphone, please. Apologies. Um, Sergio, I think um, we should start from the start, from the foundational questions. There are questions here about mattresses and beds and whether or not there are better ways to sleep than other beds. Uh, Otherwise, um, should you lie flat, elevate one's legs, one's head? There is a lot of advertising around certain bed designs. Are the claims accurate? And uh, is it better to have an electric or motorized bed? Uh, uh, Professor, okay, Rochelle, can I come to you, a rheumatologist? What do you say to patients? So firstly, there's, there's hardly any evidence about mattresses and while I'm at it, pillows. Um, I'm only aware of a couple of trials in for mattresses, and basically, it's a not not too. It's like Goldilocks, not too not too firm and and not too soft, but somewhere in the middle. Uh, that's about all we know. Uh, and so, a lot of that that advertisement is is um, fantasy, really. Um, so I, it's usually find a bed that's comfortable for you. Uh, to sleep in I mean often we do hear that people get back pain when they've slept 
on a, not on their own bed, you know, when they're on holidays. And, and usually it's because it's a different um, density. Um, I don't think there's any difference between electric and non-electric. Um, I know the physios usually advise one pillow sleeping on the side, but again, it's not really based on any high, high certainty evidence. Um, I don't know if um, Paulo or, or James knows anything else, but but I, I think the jury's out, really. And can I just, just ask, because sleeping with dogs has been raised and an awful lot of people sleep with their pets, is, is that something one really should consider if it's, <laughs> uh, you know, affecting the way you lie and stretch out and so on? It's probably my, my next research project. After, after this acute pain that I developed, truly. <laughs> But yeah, I think it, it's about awkward positions. You know, we know that spending a long um, amount of time in awkward positions is a trigger for for back pain. We know that from previous um, studies of um, acute episodes of back pain. But the dog situation that's new for me. <laughs> um, look, I'll come back to our, our general practitioner, Dr. Lena Safra, for another question, please. Sure. Um, somebody. Um, is interested in therapies such as Feldenkrais and other somatic therapies, and they want to know if there is a role for them in the relief of symptoms and extending the range of movement. Uh, um, oh, look, what I might do, if I may, is come to Paulo Ferrara again. Because of your background as a physiotherapist, I might also come to Cody for a comment as well. What would you say to that? I don't know much about um, these exercise programs. Maybe maybe Cody can can help. You know, Cody. I when we've spoken, I should introduce Cody as the uh, um, general manager of physiotherapy and day services at Walpole Jewish Hospital. Physiotherapist himself, and I know one of your passions in terms of a message tonight is to ensure that people get evidence based advice from well trained health professionals. And so your comments, I guess, on well, Feldenkrais, but also there are a range of activities, aren't there, that we that are advertised. What's your general advice to the people you deal with who have back pain about decision making about about what classes to do and not to do? I think one of the main things is, as the people, other panelists have mentioned, is just getting people to do some type of activity. I think more active type things are, are better to do rather than passive things. So. Sometimes it's getting people to come in contact with a health professional who can offer some solutions such as that. I'm not overly familiar with Feldenkrais. I've had patients who have been, who have done that before and had good results from it. So I think if you're doing something actively, then it should be encouraged rather than a more passive type approach. My understanding is at Walper, you essentially aim to take a conservative approach initially and to get a very detailed history and understanding of the person, their, their history and their lifestyle. Could you speak to that? Why is that your approach? Yeah, I think you just need to get a lot of information, background on people that may be influencing on, on the pain or how long it's been around. So I guess the clientele we see often have been through numerous therapists, potentially may have had surgery, may not have had surgery, and then have come back with, ongoing or recurrent back pain so they're they're kind of looking for answers so a lot of our approach is education in the first instance um, and then looking to develop some good positive habits related to exercise and then if that fits into services that we may offer then fantastic or if there's other people we can refer to in the community then we would look to do that but I think it's making sure that you're looking you're considering the person as a whole and then looking at what they can potentially do versus a lot of clinics, I guess, go into very hands-on therapy, which a lot of patients like. That's why they go there. They can have their hands put on. But in terms of long-term benefit for a patient, we need the patient to actively be doing something in the process. Thank you. Uh, I may come, if I may, to another question uh, from Lena uh, from our audience. Thank you. We've got a few questions about um, people being told that they need to exercise, but not having the detail about what it is they exactly should be doing. So they're being told about strengthening exercises. Someone else is asking about keeping core stomach muscles tight. Um, what 
type of exercise is the best for back pain prevention? I'll come to uh, uh, Rochelle Bookbinder first, if I may, and then I'll I'll come down the line. Thank you. So, uh, as as um, Paulo said, and every is there's lots of different forms of exercise that are out there and that can be offered. In in it, looking at the evidence for what works and what doesn't, it doesn't seem to actually matter what type of exercise you do. All types of exercise probably provide a little bit of benefit. Uh, and they're, it's better than not doing any exercise. Um, in terms of which exercise is better than the other, I think the jury's out. And, and as Paula alluded to, there's a big study going on at the moment trying to work out, you know, a hierarchy. Um, but I'm not sure that we'll actually find a hierarchy. Uh, Feldenkrais involves doing things away from the body, the, uh, away from the pain. So that, that's what Feldenkrais's theory is. Uh, and again, you know, I think if you believe in that and it helps you, then that's fine. Um, but many of the, these things, probably the the benefit comes from the caring therapist, um, you know, being actively engaged and, and helpful to the patient. Uh, and so it really doesn't matter what type of exercise that you do, as long as you're doing something. Well, thank you. I don't know if you realise it, but I disappeared there for a while, yes. but I can you again so thank you Rochelle for continuing um I guess I've got one question before I, I, I come to our, our next panel guest and that is why is exercise good you, well you know, I think, why, why I think I think the bottom line is exercise is good for everything it's not just good for back pain but it's good for well-being it gets endorphins going and you feel good and that will help you to manage your back pain or or live with it more comfortably uh, and in terms of specific exercises people argue all day whether it should be general aerobic exercise so exercise that gets your heart rate up or exercise to strengthen your tummy muscles or your back muscles and from what we currently know it doesn't seem to matter so I usually suggest both. I usually suggest something to get their uh, heart rate up because I think aerobic exercise helps them with their general well-being and things like swimming are, are probably just as good as others. And then something to help with their core strength. So things like Pilates, um, things like yoga. But but again, as others have said, it's got to be something that that people want to do and want to and enjoy doing to, to make sure that it's something that's uh, you know, viable longer term. Thank you. Let me welcome now Professor James McCauley, who's uh, patiently waiting and uh, it's lovely to see you, James. As I said, James McCauley is a psychologist by background, professor in the School of Health Sciences in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of New South Wales and the director of the Neuro Centre for Pain Impact. So welcome to you. Can you just explain that Neuro Centre for Pain Impact? and the thrust of that work. Oh, sure. Um, uh, lovely to, to see you again, Julie, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to um, the, the people who are listening tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm the director of the Neuro Center for Pain Impact, and um, impact actually stands for something for us. So it's um, investigating the mechanisms of pain to advance clinical translation. So we're really interested in, and that question about why does exercise work? This is the kind of thing that really excites me and gets me interested, trying to figure out what it is about the interventions that, that do work, what is it that makes them work? And if the interventions don't work, but people still feel good afterwards, why is that? Um, Rochelle mentioned that um, if you find an exercise that, like Feldenkrais, for example, if someone, if my mom came to me and said she wants to do Feldenkrais, she did it and she really liked it, she felt better afterwards, I'd say, fantastic. Absolutely, that's what you should do. That's the exercise that you should do. Whether or not Feldenkrais has a specific effect over and above the fact that that um, the therapist is being nice to my mum and she likes to do it, whether or not there's a specific effect, well, the jury's out on that, we don't know but it doesn't really matter to my mum if she's feeling better. As long as it's not harmful, I think that's completely fine. So this is the kind of stuff, I guess, that we're interested in trying to figure out in our group, really, um, why treatments work, why interventions work, and why they may not. And then taking that to try and invent, develop 
new interventions and then test those with people with back pain. And as I understand it, there is new evidence emerging that are leading to new ways of approaching back pain. And one uh, statement is the pain system is the problem, not what's happening in your spine. The pain system is the problem. What do you mean by that? And, and how does that translate into how you approach someone who says, I need help with back pain? Sure. So, I mean, first of all, I'm not a clinician. So, um, I I'm a researcher, a researcher only. I, I've I've never seen um, patients in a clinical setting before. So, just research. But the reason why um, we became interested in the brain was because for the first half, I think, of my career, um, I was working with a very very good group um, of of ex 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 exceptionally well, um, exceptionally good. Um, 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 researchers, and we developed a program to look at all of the interventions that you might receive um, if you went to see, for example, a physiotherapist, or you went to see a chiropractor, or you went to see your general practitioner. So we tested whether or not manual therapy, which is when a physio, and this is a psychologist explaining what a physio does, but when a physio might press on your back and press on the on on the on the spine on your back to try and loosen up. Um, your, your, your spine because they believe that it's stiff and that might help you. Um, we also looked at different types of exercise as well. Um, we also looked at different medicines as well. And we tested those against placebo. So it's quite hard sometimes to think about what a placebo intervention might look like for manual therapy, but you can develop those and you can test whether or not the effect is just because the physio is giving you that and being nice to you or whether there's a specific effect on top. And what we found when you test those therapies, including exercise, including medicines against standard, uh, against placebo, is that there's a very little effect on top of those, what we call placebo effects, or just those um, um, contextual effects. There's a small effect on top. That doesn't mean as a person, if you go and see your physio or your GP, you're not feeling better afterwards. We know you're feeling better. You feel, if you feel better, you feel better. But I'm interested in what was that extra bit on top. And it looks like all of the things that was that, that have we've been trialed in the past, all of the interventions that you would standard get from a physiotherapist or a general practitioner or a, or a physio or, or, a, or, or a chiropractor really don't look that very effective. So I got a bit disillusioned by this. This is about 10 years ago. And I came to a colleague of mine who was working at Neuro. He's a physiotherapist, but this is a neuroscience institute. And um, they were doing some really interesting work about the brains and what's happening with the brains. And, and, and he, he was really interested in what pain is. What actually is pain? And what does it, what's, what's the purpose of it? Why do we feel pain if we just have an acute injury? But really importantly, why do we ha end up having pain for a long time? What is it that happens that pain happens for a long time? And is it to do with what's happening in your back? Is it still to do what's happening in your back? Or maybe it's more to do with what's happening in your brain or the system that produces the pain. And the theories about pain that we became really quite interested in was that the brain evaluates information that's coming from your body, all over your body, sensory information, your brain evaluates that. And it's it's got a little filter um, in the um, at the base of your brain and it's evaluating all the sensory information that sensory information that's coming into the brain. And if it detects that there's a threat to your body, if it detects as a threat, then you will experience pain because the pain is saying, remove that threat, get away from that threat, stop doing what you're doing and do something differently. So that actually could be exercise, right? That could be if you're doing a lot of exercise and you feel a bit of pain, it could be stop doing that and do something differently. But your brain also, what we also know about your brain is it's not just doing that, um, that evaluation of the sensory information um, um, without any context. Context also really is very, very important to that evaluation of the information that's coming from the rest of your body. So if you're feeling happy or you're feeling sad or uh, the past, you think you, you've had bad experience in, uh, with something in your past, and you're doing the same thing now, there's something you might have hurt yourself in the past, you're doing that same behavior again. All of these contextual um, influences also end up producing, um, uh, making the pain, uh, making the sensory information more, appear to be more um, 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 threatening, and therefore there's more pain experience. So that's, they were working around this, people I was working with were working around these types of theories, and I became very interested in those theories, and how we could turn some of this into a treatment to help people 
um, who have had long-term back pain. And, and could I just say, because obviously we've got a lot of people listening to us who have got long-term pain, back pain and this they're thinking what does this mean for a new way to treat me and as I understand it when you talk about the pain system to some degree you're trying to change what are called neural pathways or and, and can you explain what a neural pathway is and give us an example of some of the new techniques that are being investigated based on this way of thinking about pain sure so for a long time, so I can talk about the particular intervention that we were interested in developing, and then we tested and we published that the, the results of that last year. But I, I should say there's a context around this, because if you listen to researchers talk about back pain, um, um, like any researchers talk about back pain, for many years, it's been a very um, depressing state, because um, we can say that, that um, oh, you've got to be a bit active. That's what you've got to be. That was the only treatment that we have, really. You've got to be a bit active. But I think we're on the threshold here. We're just on the cusp of a completely new way of thinking about managing um, long-term pain, long-term back pain. There are three trials that have been published in the last, in the last year. Our own trial, which we published in JAMA, um, a, a, an intervention called pain reprocessing therapy developed by some, a group in the, in the United States at Boulder University. Um, and another um, intervention called cognitive functional therapy. And each of these therapies, they're developed by completely separate groups, but they're all trying to do the same thing. And what they're trying to do is to change the way the brain evaluates information that's coming into it um, from, the, from the periphery, for, from the back. And at, what we realized a few years ago was that the information that's coming in is not accurate. Um, and But we can treat that and make that information, try to treat that to make the information more accurate. I'll give an example. If you had back pain, or well, Paolo's got back pain, um, Paolo, you've got back pain in the minute. If I touched you on your back, you would have difficulty telling me where you're being touched. So you have difficulty locating pre precisely where I'm touching you on your back. You've only had back pain for a little bit of time, so it wouldn't be too bad at that. But if someone has had back pain for a long time, they're not very good at that at all. They can't locate precisely where we get they're being touched on their back. So that shows that the information that's coming up in uh, from that area um, is not accurately represented in the brain. We also know that if people are asked to do some movements, that the um, like for example, if you had a back pain for a long time and you're asked to bend over, for example, um, they may you might ask someone to bend over and to roll their back and to bend over. Often, what people do is they they don't roll their back, they just bend over quite stiffly, but they say they're rolling their back. So they don't, what's happening in their back isn't represented again accurately in their brain, but we can we can treat that. And we can treat that by just getting people to do particular movements over and over and over again. In neuroscience, you got to do stuff a lot of time to make it work properly. We get them also to watch videos of people doing um, 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 provocative movements and we get them to watch videos of people in the end playing golf or sitting on a horse and bareback and they hate doing that they really don't like watching those videos but after a time and imagining themselves doing that after a time they become deconditioned and they become de-threatened by that by those types of behaviors or they they end up being the, those behaviors are less threatening to them so after a time they're, they, they feel that their backs are more normal they feel their backs are stronger and then we get people to think about, OK, well, what are the activities that you're that um, you're restricted in doing? And that's just standard goal setting that most psychologists will do and try to work gradually towards achieving those goals. If you put that whole thing in a package and I've just gone over a, in, in 12 week package and you test that against a placebo treatment. So a treatment that might have machines, for example, that are on your back, but they've been turned off, but we don't tell people that they've been turned off. And it's a compelling treatment. It's a, sorry, compelling um, um, placebo treatment. If you compare that, you find an effect and you find a clinically meaningful effect on top of the placebo effect. So, and then at one year, we found that half of the people who received the, who received this intervention that we developed, Half of them had almost no disability, so one or less on a on a on a um, on a um, disability scale, and that's at twelve months. So we're really excited that not only have we that this new type of treatment has been able to produce uh, help people to feel better, but actually the sustained effects. And this is, I think, the most exciting bit about this type of new treatment. Um, paradigm that those are sustained effects this is recovery we're starting to think about 
And this is the first time yeah. we've really, I think, been sort of thinking about this. Thank you so much, James. I gave that a lot of time because I wanted people to be able to, to really listen and understand what you're saying because you feel possibly, potentially, there's hope for people with chronic back pain. Cody, I want to come to you in a moment if you've got any questions or comments or can I come to you now and then I'd love to hear from Professor Rochelle what she's thinking about what we've just heard but what's on your mind Cody as you listen to that very very interesting very very good I think a lot of physios um, struggle to deal with back pain and because they're a little bit unsure of what to do or where potentially it might be coming from in the areas to work and I think a lot of people are starting to consider some of the research down those lines and look into how we can better treat these these patients and what is actually involved versus potentially what we actually just learned at university. So I think it's, um, it's very interesting. I enjoyed that. <laughs> can I just bring James, if I may, back and Cody, if you could stay for a second. One of the challenges when research indicates uh, um, a possible new approach is this delay between research innovation mm -hmm. and, op and optimism and at implementation, like Cody is at the coal face in a rehabilitation hospital, seeing yeah. a, a lot of older people who are having things happen to their, to their mm -hmm. spines and other bony bits of their body. So mm -hmm. what are you, what's going to happen in, if this research continues to look promising? How will the Cody's of the world learn about this new approach? Can you just, any thinking there yet? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because um, I, I have to be really careful about this because we found this effect uh, in, in a group of, we had almost 300 people. So 150 people had the treatment, 150 people had the um, placebo treatment. Um, but that's one trial. Um, and we have to be extremely careful about, um, even though there is, I believe, I believe that there is hope for people with back pain, but that does need to be replicated. And we do need to test whether or not we can train physios like Kobe to deliver this in a way that helps people. Back pain is, the back pain field for years has been full of different types of treatments that are developed and pushed out into clinical practice well before they're mature enough to actually um, be delivered to people. And we need to, and, and um, so we have to be a bit careful for that because th that is extremely common in the past. And those interventions before they're fully developed, maybe there was something in them, but um, and but they, 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 they um, it's too soon. So we have to be a bit careful about that. We do have a plan, um, but, um, and with planners, of course, I'm a researcher. I'd like to get some more money to test this in practice, right? To see whether or not I can test, I can train to go, I'm Cody and Cody can go out and cure some people. I want to do that. So let's see if we can get some more funding to do that. And that is a horrible thing for the people to listening to this to hear, um, because it's not something that Kobe can, uh, Cody can do tomorrow. It'll just take a little bit. Yes, it's bit in the time. future. I, 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 I'm a cancer survivor and I live with this thing of living in the future. But Rochelle, could I just have a comment from you as, as a, you know, yeah. working room? This is so, so interesting. Sorry, before Rochelle says anything, because Rochelle is one of the biggest researchers in the world in back pain, right? So I feel like I've just explained to someone. <laughs> it'd be very interesting to hear what Rochelle says about this. So don't worry, James. Uh, as you know, and Paula knows, I am the biggest skeptic. Uh, and I've been trying to fix this problem for over 30 years. But I, I totally agree with your comments. And we definitely need a new approach, particularly for people with chronic back pain. So for people with acute back pain, it's important to know that it doesn't matter what you do. Most think people get better and it's got nothing at all to do with the treatment. So you, you have for a treatment to be effective, it's got to be better than getting better quickly anyway. And that almost can't happen. For chronic back pain is where I see the biggest problem. It's the biggest problem in terms of cost, in terms of disability. We know it affects poor people and lower socioeconomic status people more. It results in, you know, poverty and early retirement. So I, I, I agree that we need a, a new approach. And I think what James is really talking about, and there are other trials as well. So there's one in Israel looking at something called ETMI, which is really similar in that what you're doing is you're coaching people to get them to move more. 
and 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 however it works I don't really care however it works but if it gets people to move more and then and that alleviates their pain then I think it, it's a really promising way forward um, right. and can I just say one thing that I agree that implementation is a big deal and increasingly researchers are thinking about implementation at the time that they're doing their trial. They're trying to think about at the same time as whether if this does work, who needs to know what, when and how. And if by putting that right at the beginning with the trial, I think we can close that gap between what we know works and, and and how we can deliver that quick more quickly to the patient. Sorry, James. I, I know I interrupted your interruption. <laughs> just before you come in, I just want to let our, our audience know that we will be turning shortly both to more questions from you, but also to hear about uh, good resources that people can go to uh, that offer information to the right here and now. But I still think it's very interesting to pursue this approach. Thanks, James. I was just going to say that the difference, I think, is that because a lot of these therapies, these new types of therapies, the roots are in a lot of the work that Rochelle originally did about changing people's beliefs. But it's not easy to change people's beliefs. And sometimes you need to get you, you need to um, show persuade them. them or show them exactly right. I think that's what we do. And I think that's what some of the other therapies do. The critical thing is to understand that your back is actually quite strong and that. And that having back pain for the rest of your life is not inevitable. Um, change is possible and getting better is possible. Those are hard things to understand and hard things to actually believe. So some of the therapies, I think these, these newer therapies are just very good at doing that with people, I think. And I think that's the kind of I would say that's where the therapeutic uh, the therapeutic effects come from. Yeah. And is there anywhere in Australia where these techniques are being taught at the moment? If someone wanted to learn more about them as a professional? Um, yeah, sure. Cognitive functional therapy um, is um, being actually is, is, is actually in practice. Um, so that um, and there are cognitive, there are people who do provide that in clinical practice. Um, yeah. Um, okay, look, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cody, do you have a question or a comment before I go, go to our audience questions again? I just think the comment before about the, the chronic type back pain, I think a lot of time from a therapy point of view, sometimes therapists just don't put in the time to actually find out what is going on in behind the, the mm. patient. It's all very transactional, very short term. So sometimes if people are unfortunate to come across therapists as that, they kind of get lumped with the same exercise that might not be be working or something like that. It's more the having that meeting a therapist who, who might listen and go through the whole journey potentially with yourself. Can I say, Cody, that I think the other really important missing thing is that what I do is try and understand what the patient thinks um, and what their conceptions are because sometimes you'll be surprised what they think. They think what the cause is or they think they're going to end up in a wheelchair. And un unless you explore those misconceptions, it's really hard to help them because you haven't talked about it. So I think, you know, as well as identifying what they've done before and all the physical aspects, understanding what they think in their brain, um, understanding, you know, what they what they're worried about is really vitally important as well, and I'm I'm sure James would agree with that. Yeah. Let us come again. Thank you to Lena and ask for uh, another question, perhaps another area of investigation uh, from our audience, please. There are quite a few people interested in treatments that go beyond the exercise that we talked about. Someone wants to know about restorative neurostimulation procedures, and someone else would like to know about the effectiveness of medical cannabis for back pain. May I come to you, uh, um, Rochelle, to answer those questions? Yeah, sure. So medic medical cannabis, uh, there is, we've done a review of um, the value of medical cannabis for all types of chronic pain, both cancer pain and non-cancer pain and all types of pain so not just back pain but fibromyalgia um, pain related to ms and the bottom line is that there 
the the evidence is not very strong, um, but the evidence really shows that it probably doesn't work for chronic pain at all, um, but there are potential harms. So we know that there is three times increased risk of things like nausea, uh, dizziness, um, probably cognitive impairment. And so, uh, uh, I th and the, the evidence for effectiveness, if there's, as far as I know, there's only one trial that's been done in back pain that didn't show a benefit but again these significant harms so that's that's medical cannabis um the other one was our oh, neurostimulation uh, so that's what I alluded to before right at the beginning um, that there are peak pain physicians who are putting in stimulators in the spine uh, to try and turn off this you know the the messages about pain and what we do know is that they're probably no more effective than placebo, but we do know that, again, they have significant harms. And we did a review of complications reported to the TGA and about some sort of complication. So we don't recommend those at all. And the TGA is the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Look, could I just bring back uh, Professor Paulo Ferreira, our physiotherapist, and also another uh, great researcher in this area. Uh, you've done research on twins. Uh, uh, could you just talk about that and what that tells us about back pain? Because I fi always find twin studies very interesting. Yeah, Julia, I can see we've got 177 people joining us today. And I can probably tell that, you know, around 1% you know, of, of the, the audience would be a twin or would have a twin in the family. Um, twins are what we call a natural, uh, very powerful opportunity for research, uh, really. Um, and because uh, they, they, they do offer us all kinds of, of research designs, all kinds of research questions really can be addressed with twins. And, and the bottom line is that um, with, um, when we do research with twins, we work in pairs of people. Um, people that um, have probably 100% of the genes in common, um, people who grew up in the same family, people who have the same age, the same sex, probably had the same diet. Most twins attended uh, the same school and they grew up together. They're very close. So we can almost tell that it's, it's the perfect experiment for people to be really, really, really paired and similar. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, twins can be discordant for a few things. And one of these things is back pain. So when you've got pairs of twins that are similar, identical for almost everything, but one developed back pain and the other one didn't, then you've got a perfect opportunity to actually try to answer important uh, questions of causation. You know, why is did that particular person develop back pain when the other one that is almost quite as similar uh, didn't. So there are many ways that, that twins can help us. Um, in Australia, we, we are lucky that we have a, a registry of twins. It's the Australian Twin Registry that is based in Melbourne. We've done quite a lot of work with, with twins uh, all over Australia. We had a center for research excellence um, in studying twins. And they were extremely useful for us. We 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 do know now uh, that certain things lead to back pain because of the work that we did with twins. So don't leave us hanging on the end of a cliff. What have you learned from the twins? Smoking, for example, you... is a cause for back pain, and we don't know quite why. But we do we do know when we follow twins over time and one twin develops back pain and the other one doesn't, the twin that smokes usually have higher odds of developing back pain compared to the other one. Um, we also know that um, when they uh, grow apart uh, after a certain uh, time in their lives, the twin that engages in more uh, physical workload type of um, physical activity and, and work is at greater odds of developing back pain compared to the twin that potentially um, is uh, less engaged in physical workload and um, probably more engaged in leisure type of uh, physical activity. We do know that the twin who sleeps uh, better has less 
odds of developing back pain compared to the twin who uh, doesn't sleep as well. Thank you. It, it, you know, it, it, it looks like sleep and exercise help everything and smoking, what do you say, destroys uh, everything. Uh, I think <laughs> when it comes to chronic back pain, chronic back pain, um, in, in a lot of in a lot of sense, chronic back pain is a chronic condition, just like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So you do find that most lifestyle interventions that help chronic disease, such as diabetes and depression and cardiovascular disease, will be helpful for back pain as well, when sleep is just one of them. Uh, can I just ask you, one of you, and I'm sorry, I can't remember, said that the Queensland Health have a very useful website mybackpain.org.au is that is that you uh Portlo? can you explain no. what's good about that? oh no it wasn't you was it no, you I mean, james I, I was the one who told you that but but that's not me who who run that program it's that one is led by professor paul hodges at the university of queensland and it's a um, it's a website that is evidence based. Um, it took then you know years to develop that resource. It's really useful. Um, we're very lucky that we have Ornella here with Musculoskeletal Australia as well, and and Musculoskeletal Australia has a helpline for people with musculoskeletal pain, and and we're trying to help Ornella to make the helpline even better than it already is. So there is a couple of resources out there for in, in the community. And, and I think, Julie, as I was listening to, you know, everybody saying about, you know, the, the new therapeutics and so on. Um, I mean, even in Australia, you know, which is considered a developed, uh, developed country, 50% of the population doesn't have private health insurance. Um, after COVID, a lot of patients with back pain are not coming to the public hospitals anymore for um, outpatient physiotherapy treatment. So people are being left off in the community, not even knowing that simple exercise can help. So, you know, in, in one side, we've got, you know, all this technology and, and new knowledge coming through. Um, and we also have that other side of the spectrum, which is people, 50% of the population, not being able to access simple exercise programs that can be effective. Can I come to you, Ornella Clavisi from Musculoskeletal Australia? Can you tell us about the helpline and also what you see as, uh, you know, two or three of the key messages you've heard tonight that you believe we should emphasize to our audience? I mean, I think the main one is around being physically active and keeping moving is important. A lot of people do think that once they do have back pain that, you know, staying in bed and bed rest is uh, the best thing for them. And often that's probably the worst. Um, so keeping moving is something that would be a key message for us. I think the issue of support is really important, having a supportive health professional or being able to speak to one of our nurses, that issue of support is really important because a lot of the time I think people have back pain and they just lose their confidence in terms of being able to move, in being able to do the things that they do. And I think with uh, James talking about the pain and the brain and, and the messages and the signalling, often uh, people are scared to actually move. Uh, and think, oh, if I if I move a certain way, I'm going to snap my back or break my back. And so being able to have that support to say, no, you can move, it's fine. You, you, the more you move, the better you will feel. Those sorts of, I think, messages and support are really important for people. Uh, and having someone at least to talk to a health professional from our helpline, our nurses, can at least support people and direct them to the care that they need or get them to a point where they they're able to seek out that care or we've got resources for people to to use and I think it's really it's it, it's would be nice to get people early because you know there are some really terrible stories about people having multiple surgeries and having really poor outcomes with regards to their back pain when you know if we got them at a certain point that maybe we could have prevented them get going down that very very severe path and just tell us a little bit about more about your helpline, its level of availability and, and who is staffing it, please. So it's staffed by uh, a nurse who is trained in um, 
musculoskeletal health. Uh, they have specialist training with regards to that. It's open nine to five on weekdays. Uh, and we do have some trained volunteers that can help with just some, some general information, but also our volunteers have con health conditions so they can provide peer support to people who are, are experiencing those conditions. Uh, and a lot of the time it's around directing people to the right services. Like, I guess it's multidisciplinary. Like you see a lot of different health professionals throughout your uh, having a condition. So being able to navigate those systems, having a look at what's in your community and being able to support people that way so they can take that information on and then be able to feel empowered to use that information. And I should tell our audience that we will send out an email uh, after this evening and we will put links to Musculoskeletal Australia, right. uh, to the Queensland mybackpain.org.au um, and also to the clinical guidelines that have been published uh, really as a clinical standard by the Australian Commission on Quality and Safety and Healthcare. Could I bring you back, Professor Rochelle, to just talk about those, that, those clinical guidelines because I think... Uh, the Commission puts them out for both clinicians and patients. Why do you think they're valuable? So they're valuable because they've been developed by multidisciplinary people. So uh, we had people, including a radiologist, a surgeon, um, physiotherapists, rheumatologists, uh, chiropractor, I think exercise physiologist, nurse, like anyone we could think of who managed back pain and we all agreed on what the basic minimal standard that a patient should expect to receive when they see someone for their back pain and so there are 10 very simple quality statements and for each statement uh, there is uh, text around what the patient should expect and why um, this statement is important uh, so it's Things like, um, you know, comprehensive history and ex take a comprehensive history and exam. Most people don't need imaging. Um, you know, if the back pain persists, go back for a review. Uh, and there's there's ones about the uh, drugs, you know, don't use drugs. Uh, and then ones around uh, physical therapy, uh, psychosocial support uh, and not having surgery. I think they're basically it. Um, and the usefulness is that it gives you patients an idea of what they should expect. Uh, and so they can take that with them to their whoever they're seeing, whichever type of clinician they're seeing, and say, this is what I expect and, and tell me about this. Uh, I think the other useful thing might be the choosing what wisely five questions that you can ask your doctor. So it's you know, why are you, what's the evidence for what you're recommending? What would happen if I do nothing? what are the alternatives uh, and then other questions that they might like like what might what might it cost and really importantly what are the potential harms as well as the potential benefits look we're very close to finishing but it, I'm just still a bit haunted by the number of people who ticked that they'd had pain for over 12 months you remember at our survey right at the beginning and I wonder if I could ask uh, yourself, uh, uh, and uh, and also I might ask a couple of others, what, what is your message to those people as they've listened to this this evening? What What is your recommendation to yeah. them or your suggestion to them? I think I think my suggestion is is much like I'm trying to think who said that 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 there's hope that they shouldn't give up hope uh, and that there are people out there that can help them and teach them how to, how to sort of overcome their their pain uh, and a lot of it can be overcome by you know breaking the myths about the you can move it won't it won't break your back um, and I know there are people that have tried all sorts of treatments and haven't worked and and are less inclined to believe health professionals um, but again I think it's about finding a caring person who can actually coach you and give you motivation to help yourself. It's really important that um, most people can actually self-manage their pain. It, you know, over 50% of people with back pain never see anybody about their pain. They just think it's 
like a normal part of everyday life and and they can manage it but if you need if it's not working then it's fine to get some help and just get some advice about what you can do to help yourself well, thank you can i come to you professor paulo Pereira, what would be your oh, advice one can i say one more one more thing if oh. if anyone recommends surgery then my advice is to get a second opinion so, and that's that i'll stop there sorry that's okay thank you so much uh paulo can i ask you your your reflections to those who are who have got chronic pain and who are listening tonight yeah, i think my advice uh simply julie would be uh, don't panic um a lot of people make wrong choice when they panic when they are in pain and that very first move that people make in terms of their um treatment pathway is the most important one and so when people have um, a flare-up of their symptoms if they do panic they might end up in the hands of um, someone who doesn't really have the best evidence or they will end up receiving heavy pain medication that will determine the course of of their condition so um perhaps wait, wait a little bit. Um, there is help out there. We just heard about um, the helpline from Musculoskeletal uh, Australia. Um, people need their proper level of support and they need knowledge. When they get a little bit of knowledge, they get better. There are some communities in South America where there is no low back pain. I mean, there is back pain, but it's not a problem. It's not a chronic condition. And it's only because people don't really worry too much about it, you know? Um, and so um, I think that would be my advice. Thank you. And Ornella, if I could just come to you, I, I, I'd love to hear what the number is for your helpline, if you have it in front of you, okay. um, or I can... You do. Would you be able to give it to us? And, and then I'll get you to say it again at the end in case people want to grab a pencil. But what is sure. the number? It's 1-800-263-265. Thank you. And well, I'll come back to you one more time. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I think that brings us to the end of our, our conversation this evening. I, I want to thank everybody. Cody Kane from Walper, Professor James McCauley, and we wish him well for his ongoing uh, research with this uh, potential new approach. Professor Paulo Ferreira, and we wish you well, sir, with your dogs. I too sleep with large dogs in odd situations and do experience pain, but I, I'm continuing to move. Professor Rochelle Bookbinder and AO, and you've stayed with us despite severe jet lag, and we, we thank you for it. Uh, and of course, Lena Safra, who has been monitoring the questions. And uh, thank you so much to our audience. And I, I do want to say that um, you will be getting that follow-up email. If you could do the feedback survey, they do take it seriously and choose topics and uh, make modifications to what we do in relation to your feedback. Our next webinar is on better sleep on Wednesday, the 1st of November. Wednesday, the 1st of November. And we'll be looking at every aspect of sleep. And just before I say goodbye, if I could hear again uh, from our representative of Musco, Musculoskeletal Australia, just tell us that number again, if you would. 1-800-263-265. Thank you so much. I'm Julie McCrossan. Thank you so much and, and good night.